and coming down the stairs to the basement, it is General Mary Eater with us. How are you? Great, great. Those are good cookies, too. I'm glad I came. Well, I'm, I'm glad you did. Well, and mom is always happy, too, because she loves, number one, she loves history. Number two, the stories of courage. And we talk about the little courage it takes to be an investor or just to someday, you know, to go to work, to ask for a raise for these little things. These women that you profiled, General Eater, the courage in this book is incredible. It amazed me. And, and I'll tell you, I found these stories beginning at just quite by accident. I was reading the Sunday paper and found the obituary of Hilda Eisen. This was in 2017, and I had to read it three times just because I was so blown away by everything she'd done. And I collected a few more after that. I know how it sounds to say you read obituaries, but as the greatest generation leaves us, these are great stories. And I just couldn't quite help myself from beginning to really follow them. The title of the book, I think, has a lot more significance than I thought at the beginning when I first saw it. Where does the title of the book come from? Well, this is in 2019. It was sitting there watching the Emmy Awards. Alex Borstein stood up to receive the award for the Best Supporting Actress. And what she said was, in World War II, my grandmother was about to be shot into a pit. And she turned to the guard and said, what happens if I step out of line? And he said, well, I don't have the heart to shoot you, but somebody will. So she stepped out of line. And for that, I am here today. And for that, my children are here today. So step out of line, ladies, step out of line. So absolutely powerful. And I want to begin, I want to ask you about Hilda in a moment, but I'd like to start with Alice, who's the first story I'd love to start this at the same place that you do, General Eater, because your book opens like we're at a chase scene of a James Bond movie. <laughs> so here's what's going on. Alice is driving fast down the road. You open with her driving very fast. She is trying to grab for, a, I think it's a revolver that she has next to her on the seat. She's just left this guy's house where she's, I think, pretended that she's in love with him. She snapped mm -hmm. pictures of some documents that are going to be very incriminating to the Nazis. And she's running away or she's driving away. And there's a car chasing her. And it's become clear that this car is going to catch up with her. And she's fairly certain that she's doomed. Do you mind finishing that story for me? Because that is just a powerful way, to, powerful way to start off the book. Well, she's in Switzerland. And Alice is a tennis star, a big tennis star in the 1930s. She is there with an old boyfriend who she's taken up with again. And she was asked to do this by the U.S. Army Intelligence. So what she's done is find in his home evidence that he's been laundering money for the Nazis. So as she's stopped finally by this other car, it's, oh, good. It's the guy who is my contact in the Army, my intelligence contact. I had, by the way, when I read that, I had this big sigh of relief. I was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> well, and then you were surprised again yeah. because he turns out to be a not good guy. And the person he's with is a Russian spy. They want the camera she has. She ends up getting shot. They take the camera, open it. The film is destroyed. Alice wakes up in, in an army hospital in Germany. And her contact there tells her, you know, I'm sorry, but we've lost everything. And she says, you forget I have a photographic memory. So all of the evidence that she's gathered is used at the Nuremberg trials in convicting some of the banks in Switzerland for laundering money. It's so powerful, this story of just the courage that she had and being in that situation. But this is just, just to be clear for all of our stackers out there. This is not a woman with a background general in espionage at all. Tell me about Alice and about her upbringing. Well, Alice grew up in San Francisco, and she was a tennis player phenomenon, even as a 14-year-old. So when she started to play in the major tournaments, she won 18 grand slams in about six years. Now, Serena Williams has won 23, but she's played for much longer. And tennis wasn't quite the where you go to camp as a kid and you have all types of coaches you know, she developed herself. And when she was, I think, right about at 1940, she said, I need to go pro. I, I need to earn money because amateurs then made absolutely nothing. So this wasn't great timing. 
uh, because just after Pearl Harbor, there were no more tennis exhibitions, there were no more tours. She tried to get into the Army. Everybody was in a uniform of some kind at that time, but she'd had TB when she was younger, and she wasn't eligible. So what she did was perform for the troops. She did tennis exhibitions for soldiers. She would sing in bars in New York uh, that were canteens for soldiers. And she was approached one night by a guy who said, hey, you know, I'd really like you to endorse this project I have. And she said, show it to me. So he does. And she said, well, I'd rather be involved with this so I can help you. And this was Wonder Woman. So she became one of the senior editors for Wonder Woman. And while she's working on that is when she talks to Army Intelligence about going back to Switzerland and meeting up with an old boyfriend. Boy, and she had she was just coming off a really bad time of her own. Uh, you write that she had been married and found out that she was pregnant. Her whole life at this point is a disaster, really was was a tragedy. It's tragedy. It's triumphs. It's continuing to fight to be able to have an impact, to make a difference, and to do the right thing. And I think that's true for all of them in this book, even if they're, and they are, wildly different in the things they did in their lives, because it's not about the job, it's about the life lessons. That's, that's a powerful message, because not only her, but all these women went on to do some phenomenal things later in their life. Uh, Alice had a big role in working against systemic racism. She did. That's what she did in the 1950s, was one of her protégés wanted to play in what was what is now the New York Open. This is Althea Gibson, African-American tennis phenomenon of the next generation. And Alice took on the entire tennis establishment and called them out. You know, do not be such hypocrites. If you want to settle this issue, let's settle it on the court. So Althea was permitted to play. She won the U.S. Open, and the next year she won Wimbledon. So Alice coaches Althea Gibson, who then also mentors Serena and Venus Williams, who are now mentoring the next generation. So there is legacy is a big piece to this, too. You mentioned when we first uh, started chatting that you originally had found the story of uh, Hilda, her original name, Hilda Gimple. And she's in Poland and she's in a town that is mostly based on what you write. It, it's, it's mostly a Jewish town. I think you said 7,000 people live there. 6,000 of them were Jewish. So predominantly Jewish town. W what happened with Hilda? Well, when the Germans moved into Poland in 1939 and the Russians also moved in, what happened with Hilda's town was that the Jews were forced to move into a ghetto in the center of town. So Hilda has six brothers and sisters, but she's newly married. She's 22 years old. She and her new husband escape. She escapes from the Nazis, not once, not twice, but three times. So after that first escape, they travel through the countryside. They end up in small towns. Her husband is a mechanic, but finally they're caught and they end up in a ghetto themselves. He delivers groceries for the ghetto, and so he talks them into letting them out. She talks the gate guard into opening the gate, and away they go. They escape again. It's amazing. So you said, you said by the way, not to cut you off, that the guard seemed not that smart, you wrote. That, that the guard, <laughs> she, she felt like it was kind of a flimsy excuse, but the guard let her go, yeah. and she wasn't coming back. Right. Yeah, please open the gate for me. Maybe nobody else asked, or at least not in the way that she did, because she made it sound convincing. So she escapes from the ghetto. And after that, they live in the forest for the next few years. I can't imagine living through the winter in Poland and sleeping on the ground in the open, because they couldn't have fires. They couldn't afford to have smoke and you know, give away their location. And there were groups throughout this forest who were partisans fighting against the Nazis, some of them met up, some of them worked together, but they were there for several years before she was captured again. When she was captured, she's put in jail. She mm -hmm. is given a bed of, of hay, you write, I think. Mm -hmm. And she hears these horrible noises coming from the next room where she realizes that, that the guards are forcing themselves on the woman in the next room. And she realizes that's going to be her. So she decides that she's going to 
she's she's gonna escape. And once again, I've, as I'm reading your words, I'm holding my breath as she's opening this window because she's she's not on the first floor; she's on the second floor, and she's opening the window. <laughs> if you don't mind, finish that story for us. There's no hesitation. She jumps right out the second story window, breaks a small bone in her foot, but oh. runs. She has no shoes. She's running in her socks. And there is a guard out there who, again, a lackadaisical guard who shoots at her, but shoots over her head. She doesn't stop. She doesn't look back. She keeps going, climbs the fence. Now he shoots too low and misses her. Over the fence she goes and runs all night long to get back to the forest. She has this idea, it seems like, like he missed on purpose, you wrote. That's what she thought at the time, because certainly she believes he could have taken her down had he wanted to. But he appeared to just not be that concerned. Wow. So she goes back into the forest, meets up with her husband, gets some help from a farmer. But unfortunately, the farmer's, um, if I remember the story, the farmer's horses pass away. The farmer's horses die. And uh, the farmer gets really angry. And now they, they get in prison, what, the, the third time? Well, after the, the death of the farmer's horses, because... He loans the horses to her to get, get back to the forest, and her husband turns them loose to return to the farm while they fall into a pond and drown. So the farmer is very angry now, and, and many of the Polish people had great resentment against the Jewish members of their community. So they come after her husband and kill him. So we get to the point where she's at the end of the war, goes back to her what had been her hometown, and there is... No one and nothing left in the Jewish neighborhood. There are, I think, three couples standing there, three, three men, three women. They're not really couples, but they're the survivors, the only survivors. And there they are looking at this devastation, and they're still not safe. So it's what do we do now? Do we go forward? Do we go together? Where do we go from here? This is how she met her new husband, who, who you also write, they weren't in love. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't, she did not love him. He did not love her. Why would you get married to somebody that you don't, that you don't love? They're the only ones left who remember what, what the town was like. When they grew up together. They went to school together. He quit school at 13 and went to Warsaw where he worked in sausage making factories. Uh, Mrs. Harry, Hilda and Harry Eisen. And Harry was probably dyslexic and that's why he quit school. But they decided to go forward together. They end up in Germany. They had to get out of Poland. They were given a ride by the Russians up to the crossing the border where the Americans were interrogating people to see if they were genuine refugees coming in. So they stayed in displaced person camps for the next two years. Many people at that time were emigrating to Israel or to other places. But Hilda had a very distant cousin who lived in California who was their sponsor, and they came to the U.S. And they ended up, by the way, stacking some serious Benjamins when they got here. Yes, they did. And I think you escape from the Nazis three times. You've lived in the forest for two years. Your only remembrance of your entire family is a little piece of embroidery, a little piece of dirty cloth that hung on the wall. And yet you are able to go forward. So... They, they move into a part, an apartment. They know no English. There is a Jewish resettlement group that supports them. They're trying to read the newspaper to figure out what America is like. And that year at Christmas, when they now have a young baby, the neighbors bring over gifts. This has never happened before. So Hilda is just shocked to open the front door and see gifts on their doorstep. The feeling of belonging after all of these years of persecution and nothing, it just had to be overwhelming. So with belonging, with community, with we're going to make our way, they, they learn English, they save their money until they get $5,000 and they buy some chickens. So Harry's in the backyard talk, sweet talking to the chickens. Hilda's packaging them up and then he sells them on the back of his bicycle. That's how they get started. Bit by bit, they grow that business to where by the time they sold it in the year 2000, they were the largest egg producer west of the Mississippi. They employed 450 people. 
and they were millionaires. And not only that, you talk about the humanitarian efforts that they had as well. They were huge humanitarians and helped so many people. They did. They gave back in every way they could. They belonged to several different organizations that were philanthropic um, in the Los Angeles area. They lived in Beverly Hills, I believe, for a number of years. One was called the Lodzer, and I'm probably mispronouncing it, organization that supported uh, Jewish charities and Israel. And they also <clears throat> supported a group called the 1939 Club, which was made up of a number of refugees from Poland. So they didn't just get together to play cards and reminisce about the old days and share recipes. They also did quite a bit for their community and supported others as best they could. It's so powerful. The um, she, she died not that long ago. She died in 2017 at the age of 100. Wow. When you were getting involved in this, and I'm reading the introduction, you have an, you have an introduction that, that made me laugh. And not because, not because it was funny, but because of the fact that you're, you referenced this document that was written at the beginning of World War II about getting the most efficiency out of women and about how women aren't particularly motivated, but you can really make them motivated. I want to hear the story about how you found this document. Cause I can, I'm just imagining you in a library someplace or online someplace and you happen upon this thing. Tell me how you found that. I was working in the Pentagon at the time and someone showed it to me because they had used it in a presentation talking about social and cultural prejudices and how that leads people to make judgments that are unfair and really, I think, unremark not unremarkable, but they lead you to having false views on how people can perform and how teams are formed. And that was how it was used in this session. So I had saved that article and, I, and then I looked it up to make sure it was real and not just an invention. So I had I'd seen it verified that, yes, this did appear in a magazine about transportation. And it was all about, well, if you have to hire women, try to make sure you hire the ones who are married because they behave better. The ones who were, are a little bit more outgoing and self-starters are probably the younger ones. And, and it was it was really offensive in many ways, but it tells you quite a bit about the culture of the times. You talk about the culture then, but still... And you write this, most of these women, they never asked to have their stories told. They never bragged about what they did. In fact, uh, the third woman that you talk about, Stephanie Check Raider, I believe, her neighbors are shocked to find out that she's part of this super group during World War II that did some some amazing things. How do these women, I mean, your, your book obviously is a, is a step in the right direction, but I still got this overwhelming feeling reading it that there's so much more that we could do to shine a light on some of the heroic actions that many of these women had. Well, I think some of it is, was intentional in terms of culture. You know, at the end of the war, the men are coming home. They want to go back to school. They want to get the jobs and women go back to the homes. Let's go back. And I think there are lots of lessons in going back because we can never go back to the way things were. No matter when that is, we always have to go forward and find new ways. Some of them could not. Some of them were stuck. Some of them were unable to talk about what they did because it was classified. Nobody ever knew what Stephanie Czech did in Germany. I found some of that much later. And then what she did in Poland because... Those files were not unsealed until 2008, and that's why her neighbors never knew what she did. A lot of the women in this book, you know, their families didn't even know what they did. It's so amazing to me. When I speak with historians, I always find, it seems, that historians have two things. Number one, they're surprised by something that they found out. What, what, what surprised you while you were researching these women? I was surprised first by the connections that many of them had to each other in many ways, or they had been in the same place at the same time, or they faced the same types of challenges, even if, again, even if the jobs were different. So for many of them, it was about risk, taking those risks, the stepping out of line piece, and then doing it because it was the right thing to do, but not because they expected a reward. Stephanie Check was in Warsaw. 
right at the end of the war. She was in X2, so she was a counterintelligence agent because her parents had been Polish immigrants to the U.S. She spoke Polish when she started grade school and then had to learn English pretty fast. So there's all types of stories and themes here, but you have to look for them. You know, we can we can watch the news every day. We can read uh, magazines, newspapers, and we can do that on a shallow basis, I think, and just skim the surface. But when you look more deeply, you can see connections and themes, whether it's risk, reward, the connection between people and the way they were able to rely on one another or learn of other stories, and that was helpful to them, and then what legacies they had. But I think overall, for every bit of this book, the real overwhelming lesson for me was one of belonging and how important it was to belong, to be valued, and to be able to make a difference, to even have that opportunity. It's funny you use that word belonging because the second thing I noticed from historians is they usually come at it from a point of connection themselves too. And I know that you had mentioned that you, speaking of acceptance, you had a struggle getting accepted into college. And was, was that part of your connection to this? Well, that, that is a motivation for certainly many things in my adult life is that of understanding how important opportunity is and that it only takes one person to open a door for you when so many others have kept it closed. I had a hard time getting into college, any college. Um, I had been turned down by many of them. I wasn't a great student in high school. I was probably a C student, probably couldn't get into anything now with that great average. But Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania talked to me, met with me. That there were career counselors who interviewed me. Yes, yes, I promise I'm going to study hard. I will do well. And I got in. I forgot about that. Several years later was when the first passage of the Freedom of Information Act occurred. You could go to the dean's office and see your records. Uh, this was before there were any processes for how you got to see files or information. So they just opened it up. So here is the paper file. They let me sit in a conference room alone. The dean looks in on me, and you know he's hoping that I don't have any questions afterwards. And so I go through it. There's dean's list, dean's list. Oh, here's the letter from my high school guidance counselor, which just rocked me. The dean came back in, and he said, he just said, what? He could tell by the look on my face that I was just shocked. And I said, look at this. So the letter said, I do not recommend Mary Kay for admittance to any college. She is not intelligent enough to complete it. Whoa. So here at 20 years old was the realization that I might not have had any career at all, any education opportunities at all, because one person had said no, but one other one said yes. So that has certainly made me loyal to my alma mater. You bet. <laughs> I bet. Um, that would make me loyal too. Holy cow. Yeah. yeah. Their colors may be red and plaid and I'll wear them every time I go there. You bet. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and it's interesting because it's so much in the same vein as these stories that you know, the woman who steps out of line and nobody does shoot her, the guard who maybe missed her on purpose the people that uh, that came and got Alice while she was bleeding and just all mm -hmm. of these little tiny things that ended up making such a big difference for so many organizations and these people that were able to give so much afterwards. It's, it's just it's very powerful to me. The book is called The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line. I'm imagining it's available everywhere. It's available everywhere and it will be everywhere plus everywhere by August 3rd. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us and talking about this history. It's fascinating. And uh, I, I think for everybody, it just is so powerful to see the courage these women had. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me know when there's more cookies and I'll be back. <laughs> All right. We got to bribe you with cookies. That's the... It works every time. <laughs> <laughs>